Hi everyone, my name is Caetano Miranda. I'm the Director for Education and the Future of Knowledge of RCGI. And today you have a pleasure to have the Professor Yonoto Fosson. He's a professor in the Department of Physics in Faculty of Natural Science of the Norwegian University of Science Technology. He has done his formation on the uh, NTNU, followed by postdoctoral appointments in Sherbrooke in Canada, MIT in US, and also visit professor at Paris, uh, the Federal University of uh, Pernambuco, the Center for Advanced Studies in Norway, and the uh, PUCI, Rio de Janeiro. So Professor Fosson coordinates the group on soft and complex matter at the uh, NTU and EU. And since the nights, they have studied clays using simple experiments to advanced ones as in the secret of facilities worldwide. So he's involved in innovation initiatives and also have a long history of collaboration with Brazilian groups and researchers. So today he's going to tell us about this, uh, uh, how this, uh, this work on the CO2 in clays. And uh, with that, I leave it to Professor Yonoto. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Katano, for the introduction. My, we can, my voice is loud enough, it's okay. Okay, so as Katano said, I come from this university, Norway, Norwegian University of Science and Technology, where the main campus is located in a city called Trondheim. Here you see the campus, it's arrow points to where our lab is, and this here is the downtown area of the whole city. It's not a big city in the world, but it's a big city in Norway, because Norway has only five million people. Just a technical issue. Uh, the slide that you see here is the one that is of the presenter. Okay, uh, so so you don't see the one that I have left? Yeah. Okay, so how do I change that? Yeah, can I try? Yeah. I don't know how to do that. No? It's okay. Yeah. So, uh, as I said, our lab is located in the building here. Our group is called Soft and Complex Matter Lab. And if you want to see more about what we're doing, you can go to this link. Yeah. So, um, again, the city. Actually, this uh, which is one interesting. In what you see, there are several interesting things. The bottom of them is actually that uh, the landscape you see is all made out of clay. There is rock underneath, but there is clay on top. So, uh, for several years, I used to work in this kind of mode. I was curious about things, and I and my sort of pure curiosity-driven research. More recently. Uh, due to funding and so on, we have sort of moved more into this situation uh, where we have uh, we have some innovative solutions, but sometimes we are looking for problems to go with that. We are physicists, so so we have this, we started to move like this, sort of from basic research into practical application, from back to basic research. And as I said, they are physicists and they think they can contribute in practical applications as well. So, clay, uh, this, if you say the word clay to people, you, they usually think of mud, and it's true, it is mud. But it is more than that. If you, um, this mud has lots of applications. Uh, I would, and they are, uh, this is a summary of all the applications, you, not all of them, but many of applications of clay. And I would say that they are low-tech applications based, based on, on clay. What I'm going to try to talk about now is that we can actually take clays and make them make high make high-tech applications from them. So what are clays? If you look at um, just macroscopically, this is from a clay deposit. This is clay just in a hand. This is an ele electron microscope of a clay. So the, the message of these pictures is that clays are flat. And if you look in the electron microscope, you see that the flatness comes out on the macroscopic level because the clays are in layer structures, consist of layers at the nanoscale. 
So this is a cartoon of that. So this is sort of the powder, the person that held in the hand in the, in the previous picture. You look at each of these powder grains, there are these stacks. Uh, and if you look more closely at what these uh, uh, cards in the stack are, they are single crystals, flat single crystals, and they are one nanometer thick. Uh, uh, so this is the crystallographic structure of this of this card. Well, important uh, property uh, which has consequences for what we get out from the place in terms of uh, behavior is that each of these cards have a charge. They have a negative surface charge and they have a small positive edge charge. So this platelet particle, which is each of these cards, have a net negative charge. This egg charge does not compensate for the surface charge. So therefore, near this uh, surface, there are cations that compensate for the surface charge. So if there is no water or liquids present near this system, this um, card stack, uh, and there are what we call interlayer cations in the charge compensating into the cathodes in between every card in the in the stack. And those interlayer cathodes, uh, they are loosely bound in the, in the structure. They can be uh, replaced with other cathodes easily or other species that have a charge. And that's important for what I'm going to talk about. So now, if you take this powder the powder grains are these stacked, and you expose that powder to humid air, uh, uh, water vapor, the, the, the um, uh, water molecules will enter stepwise into, into this car structure. So the, 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 if you start at zero, there's so zero water in, in, the, in the, this car structure. Then eventually increasing the, say, humidity in the air, we will get one layer of water in, in there. Increasing the, humid, the, the relative humidity further, we will get two layers, eventually three layers. Then it stops there in general. It can be some cases like it's four and five, but usually this is the normal situation. Now, if you take this powder and instead of just exposing it to water vapor, put it in liquid water. Then you get what I just described, this is called crystalline swelling, where you get this uh, increase in, in uh, integral number of water layers in the, in the structure. If you then put it in liquid water, you get this is called osmotic swelling, and then this cards separate at larger distances. With the, bulk water in the chamber. So it's important to, to remember this, that we have situations with crystalline swelling and osmotic swelling. Usually we get the crystalline swelling when you expose this, this uh, um, clay dexocarge to gases, and you can get the osmotic swelling when you expose this dexocarge to liquid or bulk liquids. And use the most common case is water. The reason that water actually enters into, into this uh, structure is that there are these cations. Water is a dipole, and uh, these cations like to be hydrated by water. So this is what this is what drives this inter intercalation of water into these in structures. So this is a summary of what happens when in the crystalline swelling case. So they have this uh, clay, it can be synthetic or it can be natural. They have these sheets, they are negatively charged on each surface. Then there are cations to compensate for that negative charge. Then, that is not, no, that's not. They stack, this is stacks, and they stack by the, sharing these cations between one layer to the other, that's what keeps it together. Then there is this a repetitive distancer in the stack, we call that the D-spacing. 
and then you can add water and then the system swells this is the crystal is swelling then one layer of water in, in the top. so how do we measure this we put this uh, clay powder in an x-ray beam and we we get uh, x-ray interference bright law of the crystal but the crystal in now in one dimension swells so we will see a shift in the position of the x-ray bright peak then we go from the dry clay to say one layer of water inside between each of these parts so that's easily detectable and measurable using x-rays so this crystal in swelling is controlled by two parameters it's temperature and relative humidity so let's look at this first this is this card i think i forgot to say that there are one nanometer thick each card in this layer structure is one nanometer thick so in the dry case at high temperature the distance between each card is what is what we measure with x-rays is one nanometer this is the scale here is angstrom so this is 10 angstrom one nanometer if you so this in this example we are at ambient relative humidity just the room relative humidity so if you cool this system down it jumps up at some point to one uh, 12.5 angstrom or 1.25 nanometers and this is the size of a water molecule the radius of a water molecule so that's what gives this jump so this is the one one water layer case then we cool down further we jump up to two water water layers in the in the interlayer then we can also achieve this by staying let's say we keep the temperature constant and we increase the relative humidity so you see here at the room temperature we are at which this example is we are at one with one layer one layer of water and if you increase the relative humidity staying at room temperature you can jump up to two layers of water so this is how the water is organized so i said i said uh, the water is attracted to the cations so in this example the cation is sodium and this is how the water is organized around the complex that is formed around each cation when uh, uh, say when the water enters in the inter 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 so this is the one water layer case this is the two water layer case this is based on simulations published in this paper down here so now i introduced crystalline swelling the next thing I will talk a little bit about is the osmotic swelling case when we put this clay powder imagine, in bulk water. So then, uh, uh, or liquid water instead of water vapor. So then we get into this situation with, with the large distances between the tables. So the, actually the first person that tried to study this in say physical chemistry uh, context was Langer. He published this paper in 1938. And then this field of study, what is called liquid crystalline phases in osmotic with swollen clay dispersions, that topic was sort of not touched by anybody until the 1990s. And then since then, it's uh, been uh, got the large activity on that by many people. So uh, the, the, the pneumatic phases here occur because this, you have now these platelets dispersed in water. Uh, and depending on the concentration of the platelets in, in the solution, you can have distances between, you can, if you increase the density, the distances between the platelets can become so that they cannot rotate freely. So they will align with one another. So if the if the distance is is large, they are free to rotate. So that makes them isotropic suspension. Then if they are not free to rotate, they will align with respect to another and be more or less parallel, and that's called an anatomic suspension. So so the concentration 
is one parameter that controls this transition from isotropic to nomadic in this in these systems. Then you use X-rays to measure that also. In, but in that case, instead of but now you work at much larger distances, so you use small angle X-ray scattering instead of the uh, wide angle X-ray scattering as we use in the crystal in serving case. So these are typical small angle X-ray scattering signals from a nomadic suspension of a grade. And you see here the concentration dependence of this of the distance between the platelets in the nomadic case. Another way of actually seeing that it is a nomadic suspension is a very simple experiment where you put the sample in between cross polarizers. And this is a typical experiment people do in all kind of contexts where you study nomadics, not only clays, molecular nomadics and, and many kinds of systems. So what you do, you have a polarizer here and a polarizer there, which is 90 degrees, so that they are crossed. If there is nothing, no sample in between here, it's completely dark. No light will get through. If you put the sample here, which is optically anisotropic, you can turn the polarization. And how much it turns depends on both the optical activity of this sample, but it also depends on the path length through the sample. So then, when you do this, and if the sample has some domains, you can imagine there are some, some domains of, of nomadic ordering, some, some are, are parallel like this, then suddenly there are some other domain which is parallel like that, and so on. Then you will get these, what you call disclinations. You can observe directly in the cross polarizers defects in the nomadic ordering. And this is another very easy way of identifying nomadic cases. And this we combine with the X-rays to, to study. So one thing which is important here is that the clays are charged when they are in this uh, in this dispersed case with the platelets far away from one another. How far away they are from another are controlled by how they interact, of course, and they interact through repulsion. There, well, there is a repulsive component and an attractive component that you can tune, and that is what we call the DLDO model. So there is always going to be van der Waals attraction. If the platelets are very close to one another, they will be van der Waal attracted. But if there is no salt in the water. If the water is pure, pure water with, without any salt, that attraction will be dominated by the electrostatic repulsion. So that the, the clay platelets will, will be repelled from one another. So what stops them from actually going to infinite is the container. So if you have a container and a given concentration, that gives a distance between the, the platelets in, in the suspension. Now, if you add salt to the system, then you get what is called an electrostatic screening, because the, the, there are going to be cations here that screen these charges, so the, the, the charges are not seen as well from one platelet to another. So the more salt you add, the more screening you have. So that allows actually to get into a regime where this system can, can become attractive instead of repulsive. So the and the repulsion will decrease when you add salt. Eventually, it will become attractive. And this you can easily observe in many situations. I mean, what as to show before I give an example, I'll just say in general ways that this fact that you can make things become attractive starting from the repulsive case, add salt, and then become attracted. This can, depending on how you do the experiment, how much salt you add, what the concentration is, how big these platelets are in the lateral directions and so on, uh, can give rise to several ways of re-aggregating the clays, several types of structures 
forming by re-aggregation when you add salt. Here's an example that we did in the lab. This, so we can make a phase diagram in, in, in general. A, a phase diagram where on one axis you have the volume percent of clay, meaning number of particles per unit volume in the container. And on the other axis you have the concentration of the salt. How many islands are in the water, meaning how much you screen these surface structures. So then you can construct by experiment with this particular diagram was constructed by doing x-rays, it's published in this paper. But this same system we can just observe uh, visually. And you see that there are this, these different phases that I have marked. This means nematic gel. This means small domain gel. So nematic gel is when the platelets are repulsive and what stops them from actually disappearing after the infinite I said is that they are in the container. But if you add enough salt, you get attraction. It's still nematic. They cannot rotate with respect to the model, so they have to be parallel, but at a distance which is determined by this, if, you, if I go back to this uh, here, which is determined by this minimum here. So then you can see actually visually, you can actually see this red line here, here. Because this is a nomadic, you see this uh, almost transparent thing here, this is a nomadic face here, this one. And on the, on the, there is a clear difference between how that face looks to the left and to the right of this red line. And it looks more, uh, less transparent on the right hand side because there are small domains that scatter light more. So now, before I get to the new results, I will just introduce two things that are important in this context, and that is called the, that is the cation exchange, and I already mentioned what that is. These cations here, I, the examples are given, all the, until now, the examples, there was sodium here as the charge compensating cation in the, in the structure. It's very easy to change this cation to something else. For example, you want to change it to nickel. What we do, we take this uh, clay powder, put it in a container, which has, which is very salty. Actually, very salty in this context means that we have about 10 times what is called the CEC of the clay in, in, in this liquid. CEC is a cation change capacity, which is, like, how many cations there are there per square nanometer of, the, of, of this uh, uh, clay layer. So then, uh, uh, ten, if you have 10 times as many cations in the water here, as you like to be in the clay, these uh, cations outside will, during very short time, some hours, go in there and replace those, 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 those cations. And that is called the cation exchange. Then, when that process has finished, we take this clay powder, which is now dispersed here, and rinse it several times with just clean water. And then we get rid of the excess cations, including the sodiums that used to be inside but now are outside. Then we take that powder out after the rinsing, we take the powder out and dry it. And then we have the same powder as here, but instead of sodium here, we have nickel in the intervals. So it's a very simple process. It's a kind of chemistry that even physicists like me can do. The other thing which is important is in this process of cation exchange, there is something called stratification, which can be ordered or random. Let's say you have this deck of cards with this cation here. So in this case, there can be yellow thing, can be sodium. Then we do this process that I described on the previous slide, the cathode exchange. It can happen for some systems that you don't get replaced every layer. Let's say you want to, let's say the green things are nickel, for example. Then you don't get replaced, in some cases, you don't replace in every layer, only every second layer. 
or some other ordered way. And that is called RAM ordered interstratification. So the cathode exchange will result in, let's say, in this example, uh, interstratification or intercalation only in every second interval. That, that can happen. And this intercalation does not, in some cases, it does not have to be ordered, it can be random. So some layers have, uh, have uh, sodium in them and some layers have nickel in them, but it's not ordered every second. So this is important for what I'm going to say next. So now I have introduced the quiz and some processes and, and concepts. We are working on actually synthetic clays, and the reason for that is that they are they, they, they are without defects, they are, there is no there are no impurities, they are very clean, and we have some hope then or understanding what's going on. If we did not do that, if we worked on natural clays, we would we would not be able, able to understand what's going on. So we work on synthetic clays, but they have the same crystallographic structure like natural clays. There's no difference except that they are synthetic. So now I want to start to say something about CO2 finally. Uh, so we can have crystalline swelling. I described crystalline swelling in water, but we can achieve crystalline swelling. We are exposing the clay powders to CO2 gas. So uh, we started to work on this around we published the paper in 2012, and at that time, the only experimental work we knew in this area was, was this paper from 1974. But then we published a paper in 19, no, in 2012. And at the same time as we published, many other people published this kind of thing. We, we have not been speaking to one another, but it's sort of a topic that people started to be interested in. So th this was our, our paper, and we showed that actually uh, this paper was a bit doubtful. They doubted themselves if this was really real. But we proved among, as I said, with my, together with many other groups at this, around the same time, that actually these interlayers can accept CO2 or you can have crystalline swelling caused by CO2. Then we have these other papers uh, following up that. Uh, uh, and then look, the one, one result coming out of that is that depend, it's very cation dependent. The interlayer cation is determining how if CO2 is entering the system in the interval. If you get crystalline swelling or not, by exposing the sample to, to CO2. So you see here, uh, these red curves are at 50 bars, the blue ones are a completely dry clay sample. They low water there, it's completely dry. We expose it to 50 bar of CO2, and you see there's basically no change in this bright peaks. Remember the bright peaks, that was the distance between the platelets in the stack. So then uh, there is no difference between the, in, in the distance for this sodium, calcium, cesium, and barium cases. But if you look for nickel and lithium, it shifts. It means that CO2 is entering into this space. So it's important which cathode is there in order to get CO2 in. So in one of those uh, papers, we probably published this table. And here we measure, we measure the, uh, how much CO2 goes in, in the case of nickel. But now, for now, I'm going to talk mostly about nickel, because this, uh, the nickel uh, as the interlayer cation, because that's the one we have studied the most. So if you, if you know, there are two ways of describing how much CO2 is taken by a sample. One is uh, the uh, gravimetric capacity, and the other is volumetric capacity. So, this in this area, people work with porous materials, porous materials that accept CO2. Uh, some some of these materials are very open porous spaces, and some are very dense porous spaces. The clays belong to the dense, well, it's the densest porous porous space. Whereas moths, as for example. That many people work on have very open pore spaces. 
So you see, if you, if you look at the gravimetric capacity, these moths perform much better than the clays. But if you compare the volumetric capacity, because the clays are so much denser, you get the same, roughly the same result. So the clays are very good performers on the world stage among all the materials in terms of volumetric uptake of CO2. That's the that's one important conclusion from, from, from one of our papers. And then the other aspect of this, since clay can compete with the moss, is the price. Because you know, if you're going to use these materials to capture CO2, the price matters. So we know that moths often are unstable, but all these, these other materials that we compete with, they, are, they can be unstable and poisonous. Clays have been proven to be stable since the beginning of the universe almost. And uh, uh, they are very cost friendly. The synthetic clays are, let's say, 10 times cheaper than the moths. And the natural clays are 10 times cheaper than the synthetic clays. So that's why we believe that it's worthwhile studying clays in this context since uh, you can compete in terms of uptake. So we can estimate how much clay, uh, how much I mean, how much CO two is captured by, by the, assuming just making some assumptions. Let's say that the if you take the, the if you have a compactly packed clay, and you, you, you consider one cubic meter, the effect the available surface area. Because the distance between these two pieces of clay, that's one on, is, is, is one nanometer. The, the surface area in one cubic meter is 2,000 square kilometers. Whereas uh, we work with powders with a packing uh, density of 1.6, so it's about 2,000, it becomes 1,000 kilometers square kilometers, is not uh, important in this context. Let's say the powder, a powder has, in one cubic meter, there is this is huge surface area. Now, if you assume that uh, the, uh, each of these cations, we assume because we now we can assume that this capture of CO two has something to do with the, the cations because we show there is a difference between them. It has to have something to do with the cations. Each cation capture, let's say, uh, 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 two CO two molecules. We we know that there is about one cation per square nanometer on, on the surface. So if each cation captures two CO2 molecules, so that means two CO2 molecules are captured per square nanometer. If you then add up all this, considering that you have this area available to capture on, you should get a 14% mass increase of the clay when it's saturated with CO2, or 0.22 tons CO2 per cubic meter. Capture, just by this estimate here. And to check this, we did some absorption uh, experiments, measuring the mass increase, and the sample is loaded. We loaded the sample with CO2, got as much as we could into there. And these are too early. This is the first checks we did, and you see 15% mass increase is what we measure. The estimate was 14%. But now we have improved this. So then the question is, I showed you that the two cations stand out as actually performing, the other ones do not. So the question is why it's so special, what is so special about nic nickel or lithium? So then, uh, and we don't understand this, but what, what is going on with the, with the, with the CO2 capture? Because I, I, I explained that uh, water is attracted to the cations because water is a dipole. CO2 is not a dipole, it's a linear molecule. It should not be so, it's, it's not attracted to sodium, or, or for example, or the, all the other cations I mentioned, I mentioned. So there has to be something else going on. And we, don't, we did not understand it. So this is the water, basically. So then we have some, some old, the, in the independent of CO2 experiments, where we studied water uptake by nickel, Confined in a synthetic 
this next part. This is the water absorption by nickel plate. And what we see if we focus on this left hand now, we are here. This is the position of the X ray brag peak for dry clay. We dry as much as we can. And the, the, this, the distance between the planes in the stack is roughly 10 angstrom or 1 nanometer. For, so this is uh, the calcium, this is the blue one, and sodium is the, is the black one. Well, you look at nickel, it actually is different. So it means that it does not shrink when you dry it. It does not shrink to what it's supposed to shrink to when you, when you, when you dry it. It looks like a very small thing because we, we, we observe drag peaks in this uh, on the higher order drag peaks as if this was the, well, as, as if it stopped here when we, when we dry it. And it actually stops there. So um, we did not understand why this nickel case does not dry completely, seemingly. Because uh, the size of the nickel molecule should not, it should not be bigger, should not be given a different stacking distance than sodium, for example. So we do not understand this. So now we can take a little break and I will just remark that since Katana uh, mentioned that I work a lot with Brazilians, if you look at these two papers, there are lots of authors, and I'm the only person that is not from Brazil. So then, uh, then I can continue. Uh, so to understand this, we actually consider the cathode exchange process when we exchange uh, sodium. So this is a clay with sodium, and this is a clay with nickel in it. And what we actually have been able to show in this paper is that. We have an, we, what we actually have in nickel is an ordered interstratification where every second interlayer the sodiums are replaced with nickel ions but in every other interlayer it's not actually pure nickel ions but it is it is this species here that is formed in the water when we do the cation exchange process if you then take the d spacing of Average key spacing on this and this, we get 11.4. So, this ordered interstratification in this case explains why this is different here to here. So, what we have in every second interlay is actually this species, islands of this species. There's some space in, the, in, the, in between them. So, this, this paper here explains quite well what. What this is about. The result is what you see there. So then the question is what does this have to do with CO2 uptake? And that is uh, published in this next paper. So what we, what we actually uh, observed, looking at the D spacings when CO2, when we expose this to CO2, is that CO2 only enters in this layer where there is this nickel hydroxide, which is this, this animal here. CO2 only enters here and not here where there is only nickel. So that explains why nickel clay takes CO2. Mm -hmm. Well, they put this another paper, which is this one. Where we, where we actually remember these platelets are charged. So what we can do, we can prepare these layers with different charges. And the charge determines how many cations there are, because there are comp cations compensate the charge. So if you change the surface charge on these layers, you change the number of cations that are in the, in the interlayer. So, and that, when we do the cation exchange and make this green, this um, nickel hydroxide species here, that also changes how big they are and how far they are from one another. 
So that means that if we reduce the charge of the clay, we get more space, geometrical space in the interlayer for the CO2 to, to, to enter and more edges on the, of this species to capture CO2. So what the result here shows is that it's good to have low charge because there's more space for the, for the CO2. And we also measured, and there's a hysteresis here, which we sort of speculate is due to when you, so it's easier, it's easier to enter. And this is, well, you need to pressurize for the CO, for the CO2 to enter. You see, for high charge with less space, you need higher pressure to, for the CO2 to go in. Then for the low charge, so here you only need a few bars to saturate the sample. With the, with, the, with the CO2 uptake. And then there is a hysteresis, which we believe is due to the fact that the clays don't actually, they can bend. So when you, you start here, CO2 and, and, and put here, then you, you, you pump, try to pump the CO2 out, out again, but it goes out from the edges first, which, which, which closes the path out. And that, Makes it that makes that is the reason for this hysteresis that we that we showed. So I should go back to this one. So actually, the best for for best performing the PFU. I forgot to say what that is. That is per formula unit. That is just a, a number characterizing how many cations there are per per unit area of the of the, of the clay. So it's just another number that describes that. So, so uh, we found that the, the, the PFU that performs best for this synthetic clay is the same PFU as for a natural clay called Montmorillonite. So that, so until now we have studied this synthetic clay. We have found that the best version of the synthetic clay is corresponds to natural bentonite or Montmorillonite. So that means that, uh, so what we're working on now is actually studying this Montmorillonite. Because now we have used the synthetic list to understand what's going on, and now the next step is to transfer that knowledge to natural place, which we need to do if we're going to use this concept for upscaling for CO2 capture. So, so we still do not uh, understand the lithium case, as I mentioned, it's still a mystery. We, can also, we also want to investigate other ions than nickel or lithium, where we, where we can uh, uh, make these hydroxides, because it seems that these hydroxides are important. Well, we have shown that the hydroxides are important for CO2 capture. So one, one thing about this is that if you, as I mentioned, we get hydroxides in every second interlayer. If you can do some trick, and we think we can, by playing around with the pH during the cation exchange, we can get hydroxides in every second, in every interlayer instead of only every second, and then we will double the CO2 uptake. That's the idea. And we're trying to do that with the, with the non-modern like, which is the, the sort of, the uh, brand name for that is Bentonite, which is a commercial clay that you can buy. So there is actually a fairly large Bentonite industry in Brazil. Uh, so the industrial upscaling of this concept would be using Bentonite for CO2 capture or CO2 separation. For instance, blue hydrogen production. When you produce blue hydrogen, and that uh, input is natural gas and water. Out is hydrogen and CO2. And then if you have a clay, a, a column of this clay, it will, it will separate the CO2 from the hydrogen. From the hydrogen and then you can empty the, so you can empty the column um, and uh, transport the CO2 underground, and, and you can reuse the column and, and, and redo the process again. That's the idea. So that is the status of this CO2 
Körfürdən bir yer var ki, onlar söyledi, mənim için de hatırlamı, asıl mənim, ama orada değil mənim için de, mənim yolda bir grups var ki, onu seyir türü, capture the place, that they are not, they are the only one that have discovered this uh, hydroxide mechanism. There are other suggested mechanisms, some of them are very speculative and some are real and some of them has to do with how, say, how big the cations here are, like in this paper. They consider the size of the cation because when the cation is too small, like sodium, there's not enough space for CO2 to go to go in. If it's cesium, there can be enough space to go in. But how actually the the, the cation then binds to the cesium is not clear when you read these, these papers. We have actually identified the mechanism, and I believe we are the only one who has a real mechanism in this area. Uh, no, I'm not talking about something completely different. That was what I want to say about CO2. It, it looks completely different, but it's not. So now I'm going to talk about colors instead of CO2. So in, a, in the world, there are two types of colors. You look so, maybe people are surprised that they're suddenly talking about colors instead of CO2, but they don't see. There are two kinds of, kinds of colors in the world. There are the chemical colors and the physical colors. The chemical colors are the ones we, we put on our clothes, we paint our houses and the cars. Usually. And they are functioned by, you see the, the color that is not absorbed. And that is governed by, say, uh, say absorption mechanisms in, in, the, in the material. So it's material dependent, very material dependent, whether you get red or blue. Then there are the physical colors. That's the one we see in the salt bubbles or in the rainbow. Because nobody, uh, they, there, are, there are no uh, say, uh, materials in the sky that actually uh, have orbitals that give you any color. The rainbow, you see, it's interference. The color you see is due to interference. Same in the salt bubble. It's the thickness of the salt bubble that gives you interference from the back. Appearing the light reflected from the front. Same with an oil film on the, on the water, you see the interference, that's what gives the color. If you actually look in nature, many, many animals and plants are colored, not with these mechanisms, that we, this mechanism that we use to paint our houses, but with the mechanism you see in the soil bubble. So, here, for example, is a butterfly wing. These colors, etc., come from this kind of structures. And the distance between, it's the distances in the structures that matters, because the distances, like here, the thickness of the salt bubble, gives the color you see due to interference. So it's the distances in the material that matters, not the, the specific material. So this, if you have, if you have, you get, Almost transparent materials to to the trick is to get the light as a penetrate to and get reflected back from some layers underneath the surface. So this is the structure of the of dotted lighting that gives rise to the structural correlation. This is a people, it's structural color, it's very structural color, and this is a rather spectacular example, it is the chameleon. It is this. If you look in the electron microscope on the structure of the skin of the chameleon, it looks like this. So what happens uh, in, uh, in, uh, in nature is that uh, actually this is a male, male chameleon. It's very interested in female chameleons, and especially one that is over there. And then uh, when he sees this female over there, he gets excited and he stretches his skin and change the color from, from this to this. And apparently, nature has designed this so that the female that is over there get very attracted to this change in color, and then they marry up into that. So then, uh, the, and what happens actually when you stretch the skin is that there are some objects on the nanometer scale, or the 100, 200 nanometer scale in the skin, and when you stretch the skin, those distances change, and therefore the color change.
So then we knew about this paper here. This is called the Comic Walker. This is a Japanese group. They took this platelet, which is uh, titanate platelets, non titanate platelets. They put them in water in the pneumatic suspension and they changed the distance between them by changing the concentration. Then you could see by interference from the uh, light, light reflected from the different layers here, you can change the color. So then they thought maybe we can do the same in place, mm -hmm. because they are also nanosheets. We put them in water and see what happens, if we can do this. So that's what we did. We took this clay, we delamined, we exfoliated it. This is the osmotic swelling, so the ions. Uh, there's a dark background here that I will come back to in the next slide, why, why we need it. Uh, not very impressive colors. So we thought, why, why don't you see any colors here? Uh, so uh, then we actually did this. Instead of, this is what I show, showed on the previous slide. What we can do, we can take advantage of this uh, Ordered inter stratification and now the connection to the CO2. See what it is. They made this ordered inter stratification and then we replaced every, every, every second layer, we replaced the sodium ions with cesium ions. Then we did osmotic swelling on this case and then we have a double layer. And these double layers with cesium in between them are not as transparent as those layers. Because it turns out that these single layers of clay, they are almost completely transparent. So all the light you shine on them, it goes straight through. Almost. You see, if you go back, if you, if you, if you see this, uh, yeah, this is what I showed on the previous slide. Not very impressive colors because the light goes straight through. But here, some light, significant part of the light is reflected and gives interference when, when, you, when you look back. And which color you see is then given by this distance between these double layers. So now we are in business because we are, they are very bright colors and they are very easy to make. And also the significance of this dark background is, uh, is, is, is evident here because the reason it's there is that most, even if these are less transparent, they are transparent. Otherwise, you would not have interference because you have to reach layers that are down in the, in the, in the structure. So this dark, and so what it means is that most of the white light you shine on this goes straight through. If you had a white background here, which I will show on the next slide, that white light is reflected, is reflected back, and you don't see any color. You need the dark background to absorb what goes through, and so that you see only the light reflected from those interlayers that gives you the constructive interference. So here. You see what happens, we have these cuvettes, these are one millimeter thick, and they, they are uh, a different concentration of clay nanosheets, so the, and these clay nanosheets repel, so the distance between them depends on the concentration, but, uh, like I explained before. So you see, uh, and they are lying on the dark background, that's where you see the color. If you put the white piece of paper underneath, the color disappears completely because you get the white light reflected back in that region. Actually, the significance of this dark background is evident if you ever, next time you see a peacock, you should look in front and in the back. Because if you see in the back it's dark, and that is this dark background that I talked about. In the front you see the bright colors, and that is from the interference from the structures that are sitting on top of the dark background. So these are, are the spectra that we measure at different volume percent in, in the suspensions. So actually we can have, uh, and this, this interference is going by Bragg's law and Snell's law combined. Snell's law takes into account the refractive index differences in the material. Bragg's law is the same as for the X-rays, it gives the interference depending on path lengths. So this is Bragg-Snell's law, 
And this M can give you, uh, say, it's called first order when M is 1 and second order when M is 2. So in this system, you can have both first order and second order drag slope color, coloring. So from this measured way, so this is the wavelength we measure, the peak of the spectrum. We have these peaks, spectral peaks here. This is the peak position versus volume per second wave for the first and second order variable vectors. Then from this equation, Braxton's law, you can go calculate lambda to the spacing between the nanosheets, and you can plot the d spacing versus volume percent. And you get this nice power law with an exponent of minus 0.84. This is a scientific mystery. We don't know why there is such a power, where it comes from. If you have, if you make a, say, red sample, you make the concentration so that uh, in this container of one millimeter, you get the red color. If you add salt to this, then you, as I said, you will reduce the, you will, uh, yeah, you will reduce the repulsion between the sheets. So by adding salt, you decrease the distance between the sheets and you can go through the whole spectrum just by adding salt to the system. So another mystery. This here, it's linear. This this uh, D spacing or the lambda is linear versus soft, which is not to be expected, because what is to be expected is what is called the divide screening length. This govern how the uh, electrostatic repulsion between sheets is reduced is 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 reduced when when you add soft. So here is the, um, for a monovalent salt, we use the sodium chloride. For a monovalent salt, there is this formula here, which uh, is kappa minus one, it's this screening length. So how that depends on ionic strength, how much salt is selling into the water. So you see, this is the theoretical curve. These are our, our data in normal plot. This is the theoretical curve and our data in linear plot. It's quite different. And we don't understand why it is like that. Another thing to mention about our colors from the clays is that they're what is called non iridescent. What does that mean? Let's say if you have uh, interference from parallel platelets and they're completely flat, the color you see will depend on the angle you are looking at it. But in our case, it does not depend on the angle you are looking at it. And that is there, that happens because there is some disorder in the, in the system. It has been shown in other contexts of structural coloration that, where, uh, for, instance, for instance, people were packing on covalent particles and so on, that you need about 10% disorder in the system on top of the sort of very ordered uh, structure that gives interference, you need about 10% disorder to get non iridescent coloration. And uh, we get this disorder because this this like that is easily bent. This is an experiment done by our collaborators in uh, Germany, in Bayreuth, where they put the clay sheets on a stretchable substrate and then they re release the stress and then you get wrinkles with the wavelength. On the, on the clay sheet, and the wavelength of the wrinkles is related to the thickness of the sheet. And the magnitude of these wrinkles is related to the elastic model. So then you can actually see that this is a single layer case, and this is a double layer case, just from the wavelength of this, this, uh, this pattern. And you can calculate the elastic model of these sheets, which is not very different from graphene actually. So can we make technology out of this? So what is the advantage that our system of making colors with the clay have over other uh, 
protocols for structural coloration. This is very rapid. Everything we do in this is self-assembly, which is very rapid. First, the order intensification is a very rapid process. The delamination, where we cleave the thing in the sodium layers, very, very fast. And the pneumatic ordering is very fast. It's, it's very fast process. The, there are not many examples of technology that takes advantage of structural coloration. If you find it in the animal world, that's based on evolution over millions of years to develop that we can use, for example. So, one example of structural coloration used in technology is this Lexus LC blue car. And that they actually try to exact mimic the nature. So, in our case, I would say we try to mimic the principle, mm -hmm. not the exact structure you find in nature. What they do here is they try to mimic exactly the butterfly structure. You see, it's a very complicated structure, which is not easy to make in a, in a, in a, in a factory. So, the result of that is that it takes eight months to produce sufficient pigments for 300 cars using this, this, this principle. So, there we have a great advantage. The other thing that we don't, we, it's, it's not a problem in our case, is the problem of producing red color. And that is, uh, there are several papers on this. I mentioned this because there are my friends, actually. So then, uh, the, 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 this is this group from Harvard and this group from Cambridge. They have published papers on this. They, so, one example to illustrate this problem is uh, the packing of transparent colloidal particles. That's a knowledge strategy that people use to make structural coloration. Round, spherical particles, and you pack them. And then you get reflections back from, in, from interfaces in various layers. So these colloidal particles are transparent. Let's say that if you have, if these particles are, their size is so that they correspond to the length that would give blue color, a short length. If you pack them tightly, you will get a blue structure factor. You will get blue color back. If you pack them loosely, you will get a red. You will get red distances back, and in between you will get the other colors. But the backscattered light is always going to be a product of a form factor, which is interference from internal interference in the, in, the, in the particles, and the structure factor, which is the distance between the particles, how they are organized. So, in the, if you have red happy, you will always have the form factor from the particles, and that will kill the red color. So you cannot get red from, from here just by making the packing more loose. Because it's always going to be dominated by the by the by the form factor. So how can you resolve this? You can, for example, think maybe okay, maybe you can make red by making these particles bigger and pack them densely, and then you can get red red color. But that doesn't work either. This is because when you let's say you have because you have blue distances, even if the particles are bigger, right? If you look at the paths, so here this diameter is the red, corresponding to red interference. But this, uh, if, you, if you go outwards, you get distances here that are the, for all the colors. And the one that has the largest contribution is the one that is, if you look from up, up. the largest contribution comes from the blue. So this, this won't work. As, as a strategy. It doesn't help to make bigger particles. The next, that what people can do um, to resolve this problem is to use what is called core shell particles, where you have a core, and then you then pack this, then you can get color distances by, uh, by, let's say this is blue distance, then you make it more loose and it becomes red distance. Then this, these cores are not touching one another and the shell is not active. So then they can resolve this. But this is solution is hardly upscalable. I mean, this is difficult to make, it takes a long time. It's not something that can solve the problem technologically. But it can be done. In effect, this is how the chameleon works. 
Because the chameleon is an exception in nature. It makes it has red color. Most birds that are red, the red color of birds come from pigments. The blue color come from structural coloration. So this is called the red problem in structural coloration. So how can you take our thing and transfer it to technology? Well, if it, we cannot say that uh, this is good because clays are sustainable materials, because clays only constitute 1% of the total material in this case. The important ingredients is this matrix, and in our case, we have so far used water. That cannot be used in technology because you take it out of the cuvette, there's no color anymore. So what we need to do is to put some matrix in here, replace the water with something that is hard and keep the distances, and then grind it up into pigments and sell them. So uh, then in this matrix, could for if the, the application is cosmetics, it can be something soft, with not such a very long lifetime is needed. If, it, if we're going to paint our house, it's going to last 100 years, we need some, something more hard, rigid, like polymers. So that's where we are now. We are trying to figure out which is the best matrix to put in here. If we can solve that, we, are, we will be rich. Yeah. So that's the, that's the status of that. And the summary of the, of the talk is that the clays can provide sustainable CO2 capture or CO2 gas separation. And clays can contribute to sustainable pigmentation. That does not fail with time because that's an important thing with this. But traditional pigments fail with time, the color fade with time. If you can keep these distances, that will not happen. So that's the thank you for the attention. And I would say that uh, I mean this could be the discovery of the depending on of course how far down this goes. And the high tech is is done there. So that's it. Okay. That was it. Thank you. So you may have a question. Yeah, I have a question uh, about the pigmentation system uh, regarding the stability of the system when exposed it to the environment. Yeah, this is part of our research plan. Ah, okay. Yeah. This is on, now we did it in water. When we actually find the good matrix, mm -hmm. the robustness of that has to be tested. Okay. It will depend on what material we put there and, and, and how we do it. So with polymers, you are expecting that it should improve the stability. That would give us the hard distances. That will not, well, depending on which polymer, what we put there, how we protect it. With the, the take care of the life cycle. Uh, uh, there are two effects related to the first application, uh, the changing of the requisite force of the two multiple layers, and uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you showed uh, shown that there are two effects. Uh, in the LCL concentration and the ions environment. The, uh, what between uh, the two effects are in general uh, are the most relative uh, to changing the uh, reversive force between failures. <laughs> uh, there are two effects related to reversive force and changing yeah. reversive force yeah. that, that are uh, in your cell concentration yeah. and the ionized environment. Yeah. And the, uh, in general, what between the two effects are the most, uh, are most relative uh, for changing the, the recursive force? No, uh, any ion, any positive species that is there will change the separation. So it will be in a controlled way with the sodium. If you uh, if you have in the, in the if you have the clay in an environment where there are other ionic species, that depending on the how many they are, I mean what is the effective ionic strength of the of the, of the solution that determines the distance. Okay. It does not depend on being sodium. It can be anything. 
like, for example, the nuclear of choice species, it, that's an island. If you, if you, yeah. Then in that case, there is no osmotic swelling because there is so much salt in the, in the water. Mm -hmm. It doesn't depend on this being sodium, that is just if, um, something we can understand and work with. So for the CO2 capture, uh, you bring us a very exciting results regarding the synthetic clays and also the natural ones. Yeah. So for, applica for uh, applications, how, what kind of limitations you may see for the case of this, the natural ones? So do you think that you can reproduce such uh, yeah, numbers? I, I see. With the similar uh, volumetric, uh, volumetric uh, yeah, I'm not sure that it, yeah, not yet, so the CO2 will take place. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have shown that we can perform the uh, parallel and we get around these spacings and the x-rays and so on. So I, I see no reason why we should not get the same result. I see. In the actual way, as, as we do this. In the just for, for curiosity, in the case of the colors, uh, have you played with the mixture to have, for instance, a gradient uh, a mixture of for, uh, for instance, either the different size or to if you be able to have a composition of different colors together? Yeah. Yeah, you can probably do that. For example, you could do that by putting some, some uh, in a control it well, yeah. Some uh -huh. foreign particles in there that locally will change, change some, some these cases. Uh -huh. You can get some optical effects or something like that. So for the questions. Yes. So um Possible to enhance the capacity of the sensor rocks in a technology and the part of the rocks, even though we are lowering the porosity. I can, uh, maybe it's the, the mask that makes it uh, difficult to, <laughs> to say. <laughs> so, it's possible to enhance the capacity of CCS. Yeah. In sandstone, even though you are lowering, decreasing the porosity in parts of the rocks, the, the low, with um, parts of the rocks of the sandstones are rich in clay minerals, yeah. but you can put more capacity to storage. In the parts of the rocks, the yeah, but, uh, more porosity and more so natural clay minerals. This, uh, what might happen is that, so let's say you have, but the, this is complicated in the real situation because the water is there also. But when, um, and I cannot say so much about that, but you can actually, uh, might be able to enhance even the. CO2 uptake by the clays by having a little bit water. Some people are claiming this. But it could be that uh, this swelling of clays, which could be locally in the, in the, in the reservoir, uh, you would, the, the clay would swell there and then force other pathways for if you want to store CO2 in the reservoir. The presence of clay might force some other pathways of for say injection of the CO2, I imagine. Uh, I don't, yeah, and it could also help uh, prevent leakage if there is clay in the cap rock part. That could actually prevent CO2 from being out. That's another effect that we have sort of loosely been discussing, but you know, this is also very far from being proven or. But this, this is something you can imagine. But clay, it would be good to have clay in the in the cap rock for this to prevent leakage. 
So, Ronato, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, it was a really a pleasure to see the applications going from the CO2 capture up to the controlling colors and making our life even more colorful. Thank you so much for uh, to be with us. And with this, we will close our uh, transmission. Thank you.